1998 racing season is about to begin. The Indy Racing League was born here at Walt Disney World Speedway two years ago with a promise of exciting, cost-effective American oval racing for everybody. Well, here today, the costs are down. There are 28 cars ready to start this race, and of the 13 races we run, there have been 10 different winners. But most important, today is the beginning of the road to the Indianapolis 500. Live from Walt Disney World Speedway, the Pep Boys Indy Racing League presents the first race of the 1998 season, the Indy 200 at Walt Disney World. Yesterday's qualifying was rained out, and that set up an interesting starting field. We begin with Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, point standings from last year determines today's starting grid, but we've got a mixture of newcomers, winners, and champions in today's starting grid. The newcomers being led by IndyCar veteran Raul Boisel making his first Indy Racing League debut. We've got winners, Indy 500 winners, represented by Ari Leyendijk in the inside of row three. And we've got champions, champions represented by the man on the pole, Tony Stewart, Gary Gerald. And Jack, we've got talent deep in the pack that's going to make this start oh so interesting. A lot of drivers switch teams in the offseason. Here's one of the new teams coming back from injury, Scott Sharp. He's now arriving for Tom Kelly's team in this colorful number eight. He was the fastest in the final practice. He's starting outside in row 10. He's got Davey Hamilton alongside, but then back behind him, also had hoped to be able to start in the front row, another new racing team. Scott Goodyear driving for Pennzoil. Jim Harbaugh, the pro football quarterback behind this club. He's back in row 11. He's got Mark Dismore next to him. Eddie Cheever's back here. It's going to be a wild ride trying to get to the front. Paul? What about other names like Buzz Calkins, Buddy Lazier, and Robbie Buell? John, those stories, the lineup, and the first green flag of the season when we come back. Gentlemen, start your engines. And the player calls to And for the first time this year, that normally aspirated roar begins to go up. And we are ready to go racing. They came with 31 cars here, 28 are actually ready to run. Now, uh, Indy champ Tom Sneva, the 200 mile an hour man, is with our team again this year. 200 miles, a one mile oval, high brakes. Your juices really have to be flowing. Well, they are, Paul. Obviously, we got three turns, a couple hills, short straightaways. Now, that coupled with high speed, heavy traffic could lead to a little road rage. But the key to this racetrack is turn one. The guy that can figure out how to jump back in the throttle on the exit of turn one is the guy that's going to go to the front of this pack. Now, at the beginning of the new season, everybody's a winner. The series got a new sponsor, Manny, Moe, and Jack, the Pep Boys. The teams get a bigger pot of gold to race for. The drivers get faster cars, but more importantly, they get the opportunity for better finishes, possible wins, and even championships. And last but not least, You've got the race fan. He's going to see closer racing. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, with the rain, they lined up the first 20 cars based on points from last year. So here's the field. Row one, Tony Stewart, the defending IRL champion, is on the pole. Kenny Breck taking his first ride with A.J. Foyt outside. In row two, Billy Boat and Mike Groff, who ran second here one year ago. In the third row, two-time Indy champion Ari Leyendijk and Roberto Guerrero. In row four, John Paul Jr. And the 96 winner at Indy, Buddy Lazier. The fifth row, Raul Boisel and Buzz Calkins, the winner of the inaugural race here. The sixth row is Dr. Jack Miller and Robbie Groff. In row seven, Brian Tyler, the USAC Sprint Car champ, making his IRL debut here this afternoon as a rookie. And Robbie Buell. The eighth row, Stefan Gregoire and Greg Way. In ninth row, Sam Schmidt and Stan Waddles. Row 10, Davey Hamilton and Scott Sharp. Row 11, Scott Goodyear and Mark Dismore. Keep an eye on those rows. The 12th row, Eddie Cheever and Jeff Ward. 
In row 13, Marco Greco and Eliseo Salazar. And the final row, Tice Carlson, the USAC midget veteran, and Jimmy Kite, who would have been further up, but he will start in the last position after a crash yesterday in practice. Now they're having problems with Eliseo Salazar's car getting it started. Sounds like they may have it going. Now let's go to Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, the problem with Mike Groff's car, believe it or not, was the accelerator. The linkage going back to the engine was not connected. It was hanging up. So they did some quick work on the bonnet. They're going to try and bring him in to the back side of the road, Gary Gerald. Eddie Cheever, a name that is familiar to race fans, not only because of his years of experience, he won this race when it rained at 149 miles last year. But he's one of those that starts way back. He's in the 12th row. A lot of talent back there to keep an eye on. Cheever's strategy, it has to be controlled aggression because they definitely cannot afford to get lapped as Stewart will be coming around quickly. Jack? Gary, you want a sleeper for the victory today at Walt Disney World? Well, just look beyond Tony Stewart to his teammate, Robbie Groff. After suffering a concussion, after suffering a concussion, Robbie Buell went back to New Hampshire International Speedway last year and scored his first victory. This team says since then he knows that he can win, and the team says we're going to demand from him this year that he wins not once, but many times, Paul Page. One very strong effort when you're talking John Menard's team as they begin the pace lap. In one mile, we will be racing with the start of the 1998 season. And Tom Sneva, that turn one is so key. Well, it is. We talked about a little bit on the opening. The problem down in turn one, everybody wants to jump back in the throttle. As you do, the car will pick up a little bit of understeer. Now, if you take, if you adjust the understeer out of the car, on the exit of turn one, if you adjust that understeer out, the car is going to be a little bit loose or a little bit tiptoe in turns two and three. Now, that's going to get the heart started of these drivers. And the guy that can hold his breath, the longest, is going to go to the front. And there you see the front row with Tony Stewart, a very familiar position for him on the pole at Kenny Breck from Sweden, driving for A.J. Foyt. Going to be a fascinating year for him as he handles that power team car. Back in the second row, Billy Boat, and then on the outside, Roberto Guerrero. They come off of the second turn, a little bit of bump up in that corner. Also, you can see to the right the uh, entry line for the pits as the pace car heads down into the pit area. Field is now in the control of the pole sitter, and that's Tony Stewart watching for the green flag onto the front stretch. 200 miles ahead. Here we go. Oh, sideways. Oh, we got already. trouble. Trouble right on the start. Car into the wall. Looking to make sure that everybody else has gotten by cleanly. And it appears they have. It appears that everybody's through. That's Robbie Groff, 27 car. It was a lot like a typical cold tire type start. You know, it's a little bit cool here today. And here we See it up looking there as they come off of one, Tom. Yeah, the red and white car back in that area. You can see him get sideways as he tries to accelerate. He tries to catch it, but he doesn't quite get it outside wall. Very fortunate everybody behind him was able to get by. Well, a bit of a stutter on the start of the 1998 season. I know Robbie Groff is going to feel uh, pretty sensitive about that one. Well, it's a so short, short day for a new season. Now we'll be back for the restart in just a moment. Back at Walt Disney World Speedway, they're still cleaning up Robbie Gross' blueprint car off of the track. We have another view for you. Scott Goodyear carrying an onboard camera a little bit further back in the field. Well, you can see it gets stacked up. He has to take some evasive maneuvers, but the, that grass is real wet. You hear the throttle. He tries to jump into the throttle, and it just spins the rear tires. But he had to be real careful because we've had a lot of rain here, and he wasn't sure what to expect in that uh, grassy area. Nifty piece of driving, though, as we watch Scott Goodyear. Now, these cars are, in many cases, exactly the same car that raced last year. A whole new concept that was born here at Walt Disney World a year ago. So we asked the ever eloquent Eddie Cheever to take us for a little tour. This is the racing car I'm be running in in this year's 1998 championship. It's a Dallara made in Italy. As you can see, it's a very sleek machine that's been developed in a wind tunnel. They spend millions and millions of dollars running air over this thing, trying to make it as sleek as possible. Underneath this engine cover is an Oldsmobile V8 four liter engine that runs on methanol. We run a methanol for security reasons because in case if you have an accident, it doesn't burn as fast as gasoline does. The way we manage to make these cars handle as well as we do is that we cheat nature. 
when they're at speed of two, over 200 miles an hour, you get a lot of downforce by pushing, where the air pushes down on this wing. And the car, though it's sitting here in the pits, weighs 1,600 pounds. At speeds over 200 miles an hour, this car will weigh over 5,000 pounds. A lot of that comes from pushing down on this wing. And the bottom of the car, we have a wing, the same as this, but runs in an inverse position, and it sucks the car down. That is what we call downforce. Having a lot of downforce is good. Having not too much is a terrible thing. If you look inside the cockpit, which is my office, everything here has been built to make it as safe as possible. All the whole car is made out of carbon fiber, and my seat is made out of Kevlar. You always try to engineer a car to take care of the worst possible situation. If you were to take all the pieces that make up this car, since it is made out of carbon fiber, it's like a big paper mache. You get a bunch of Kevlar, some glue, you slap it all together, you put it in a mold, and you put it in an oven, and pop comes out your racing car. I make it sound easier because I don't make them, I just drive them. All of the engine and the telemetry is run through computers that are underneath these two side engine cowlings. Um, everything is done nowadays with, uh, with uh, computers. I even have something inside of the tires that sends a signal to the pits that tells the engineers that I'm getting a flat. At the speeds that we're going, sometimes you only have one second to make a decision whether to stop or to continue at speed. And one second in this business makes a lot of difference. These are very delicate machines. They take a lot of tuning. They take a lot of thinking. And when you get everything right, you win. If you don't, you lose. And of course, the idea that they are using last year's car is part of that whole cost-effective idea. There's some update kits on the cars, and they've done a number of things relative to safety, but at least you can still use last year's machine. Well, that's the key. The update kits cost maybe $35,000. In the past, most times in IndyCar racing, it was about $350,000, $450,000 to have the update kit, which was a new race car, every year. And this, this strategy, this formula, I think makes a lot of sense to especially the owners, the guys that are paying the bills. They roll down the straightaway between turn one and two, ready to come back to the green flag as soon as they maneuver off the corner. Tony Stewart, of course, will have the field in single file as they come back to the green flag. Stewart, that bright yellow car carrying number one, signifying that he is the IRL champion. Well, he'll probably bring him down a little bit quicker for this start as compared to the restart. But look at the jump underneath. Oh, Roberto Guerrero takes a what look a, inside, races him to the flag. What a great move by Roberto. Uh, excuse me, Raul Boisel. There, there are a number of white cars here. There are a number of black cars here. First race of the season. We're still figuring some of this out. Raul Boisel jumps into the lead. Well, and that's Roberto we're showing no. right there. I'm crazy. I'm, I'm nuts. That's <laughs> Roberto Guerrero. Saw a 30 car. That's Roberto. I apologize. Tony Stewart, second place. That's Kenny, Kenny Breck the back there in the power 14. team. He's got a few of them stacked up behind him, but uh, Roberto is off and gone. He was very quick in practice, so it's not real surprising to see Roberto go. Leaders have managed to pull away here in the early going. Roberto, a 1.3 second lead over Tony Stewart. I talked to Ken. the nine, tenths. We just saw the power team, Kenny Breck. We talked to him a little bit last night after practice. And he was happy with the car. He wasn't sure, though, uh, that they had the right setup to begin the race. AJ had convinced him that they didn't need a bunch of understeer put in the race at the beginning, and so he was a little concerned the thing might go loose as the fuel load goes down. So it's Guerrero Stewart at green car. Behind Kenny Breck is Billy Boat. He's really the teammate. The Conseco car of AJ Foyt stable from last year right behind this number 14 car. There he is. And just behind him, that black car, and there are several black machines and it's kind of difficult to tell but the team in this case has tried to help us out Fred Fredway and the group put a little bit of tape on the nose and on the air intake on the five car of Ari Leyendijk there comes Leyendijk through the scene back at the front Roberto Guerrero Jimmy Kite who started last the backup car owing to an accident and Roberto Guerrero now has that delicate job of working his way through traffic Tice Carlson just ahead of him now. Well, with Jimmy Kite, he had to start the backup car, no laps on it, and obviously they didn't get the balance too good or as good as he had on his uh, race car. Oh, the 21 car, Roberto Guerrero, now has his work cut out for him. He came around Mike Croft. Now oh, we got trouble. trouble. We got trouble. We are in trouble there. 
That's on the straightaway coming off of turn one. Well, that's Salazar right there in the Reebok car down on the infield. Salazar. And we'll look around. Well, we got another white car. A bunch of other cars in that. Well, that's traffic. That's the that's the leader there against the outside wall. Again, but, he was in heavy traffic. But why he, is he there? What? Oh, he was coming up on top of that group, and Salazar was just a little bit ahead of that. He got pushed up to the wall. Well, there were three or four guys sort of stacked up fighting with each other at the back of the pack, and the Mark, leader runs Marco up on Greco them. Marco there. That was the car I was looking for because there are several wheels laying out on the racetrack. There's Lion And there's Lion Dyke. So we've got some very key players out. 14 laps into the race. So the caution yeah, out. Brian Howard, the starter, the flagman has it at the line going into one. Well, we got Roberto right back in that area trying to go high to get around. Actually, it, it looks. Yeah. What happened is it looks like Salazar was in front of that whole pack and got side. Here's Salazar right here. He he loses it right in front of the leader, and he the leader is trying to pass lap traffic. So very unfortunate timing for Roberto to get to that exit. As we suggested, that whole group was sitting just ahead of the leader. And I watched him go to the outside. I well, thought he actually down got Down at the clear. bottom of the racetrack, you see Salazar. He's just real low, and the car just jumps sideways. Oh, what happened was Marco Greco in that black number 16 car moved over to the right. That took Roberto Guerrero into the wall. And as a result, Tony Stewart assumes the lead of the race. So we're under caution here and we'll return with more of the Indy 200 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Paul Page and Tom Sneva back at Walt Disney World Speedway. The leader's car, Roberto Guerrero's car, sits against the wall. He climbed out of the car as a result of an accident that started as the leader was overhauling some slower traffic. Well, yeah, here's uh, actually the white car down at the bottom of the racetrack gets sideways. Now, the leader's coming up on traffic. Uh, Marco Greco sees the accident. He moves over to miss uh, the Reebok car, and uh, Guerrero's right there. No place to Roberto go. Roberto Guerrero is the leader of the race into the wall. LSAO Salazar is in the pits already, and there's a lot going on on pit road, Jack. Well, a lot going on, Paul, in the first big nose change of the 1988-98 season from Indy 500 champion Ari Leyendijk. Now, this is the nose he just took off the front of his car. You can see where the honeycomb and the carbon fiber was collected in that crash, and most importantly, the wing for adjustment. The cost of this nose change to this crew how about $20,000, Gary Gerald? And problems for a man who won the first IRL race ever here at Disney World, and that's Buzz Calkins. They've got a miss in the engine department. He's been in the pits twice. They're buttoning the hatch back up. They're hoping to get him back on track, but he's lost a lot of time already. Now, also over here, Alan Pagan, who is the car owner for Roberto Guerrero. I'll tell you what, you guys can't buy a break in terms of any good luck. What did your driver tell you? Well, he just said that evidently Salazar spun and Leyendijk went high to avoid it and clipped him and put him in the fence. You felt like you had the setup that was going to win this race, I know. Oh, absolutely. We thought we had him covered all week. Well, another tough break for Guerrero and Alan Pagan. Better fortune down the road in Phoenix. Thank you, Gary. And I'll be home soon, Kim. Of course, the, uh, the video shows it's slightly different. What actually clipped him, again, one of the black cars, was well, Marco Greco and put him into the wall. We're still under caution at Walt Disney World. Well, John, we have 22 laps into the record book, though uh, the last uh, 10 have been under yellow. And one is situation that was created was Roberto Guerrero, the race leader, was taken out of competition, Jack. And Paul, he collected a bunch of cars, including Marco Greco. Both of them have now been released from the hospital. First, Marco, your side of what happened. I'm very disappointed because uh, we prepared, you know, in the last minute for this race and we, everything was going fine. We were very pleased with the result we had in the few laps we did. And unfortunately, uh, again, uh, I have been hit in, in my back and someone spin and I lift off and keep on the same 
place where I was because I was already on, almost on the exit of the turn, and then suddenly someone hit me from behind. Then I found out it was uh, Robert. It's a shame because uh, uh, we spent a lot of money on this thing, and uh, uh, happened this way. You know, it's not my fault, and it's uh, really I'm very disappointed. Roberto Guerrero, one of the problems working on an oval is the fact that when you're closing on traffic, like Marco Greco, it can become a handful. Well, stuff like that can happen, and really what, what initiated the whole thing was the spinning car, because he had to move to the outside to avoid the spinning car, and I was going around the outside of him. So it's a real shame, because, I mean, it was quite obvious that we got the car working so well, and now we'll have to wait almost two months for Phoenix, and we wanted, I mean, we were sure we were going to get a a few good points to start the season and it's uh you know it's very disappointing especially with uh with the pagans paying everything out of their own pockets and hopefully a good result would have helped us with the sponsorship but hopefully the good showing will still help us well gary gerald both drivers are okay and both will race again come phoenix and jack we're with another driver that went out early it was coming down to the green robbie gruff what happened on the front straightaway well, it'd be really easy for me to tell a lie, but which I'm sure other people have in the history of motor racing, but it was, uh, unfortunately, it was completely my fault. Uh, the, the, the day's a little bit colder than it's normally been. I tried to really get my tires warmed up for the start, and, uh, you know, I'm really familiar with the torque that these engines have, so I really tried to really squeeze on the throttle really gently, and I thought I did all that, and uh, when I accelerated for the start, just uh, lit up the rear tires, and, you know, you guys saw the rest, but it's really... It's ironic because I feel the reason why I had this opportunity to drive for a great team like Blueprint this weekend was because I don't do things like that. So I'm really, really upset, disappointed with myself. Hopefully we get to do this again and just want to thank my sponsors, Lycos. And all right. Well, sometimes even a lesson you thought you've learned doesn't work out. Glad you're all right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Well, Robbie was in that first yellow as we we're getting ready to go back to the green flag at the conclusion of this lap. Mike Groff, his brother, was also right in the middle of all that. Fortunately, he avoided everything on that uh, second yellow that took out the race leader, Roberto Guerrero, and I think the video was very clear about what happened. Well, I think it's great for Robbie to stick around. When something like that happens, usually you won't find the driver, and it was pretty nice of him to stick around and let us know what exactly happened in that situation. That's a tough deal, but it, it happens. And if you do find him, then they do stretch the truth in one direction or another. You never did that, though, Tony. No, Probably very seldom did that. Straight arrow. It was always somebody else's fault. Very seldom. Bringing him back to the green flag, Tony Stewart, Kenny Breck, Billy Boat, Buddy Lazier, John Paul Jr. That's the lineup. We're racing again. Well, Stewart and Kenny get a little bit of jump on the uh, next couple guys in line. Uh, actually, it was Tice Carlson that held him up just a little bit, but there's Mike Groff finally got by Tice. Mike Groff, the 10 car. For battles uh, back in the field, rearranged, owned into the way the cars realigned as we came back green flag. Stewart now very familiar position begins to work away from Kenny Breck in one lap with a one second interval on it. And Paul, one of the things that's happening down on Pitt Road is Tony Stewart is already going into fuel conservation. They are concerned that they don't get as good a set of mileage in the first run as let's say Kenny Breck for A.J. Foyt. Now Foyt's crew gets about 192 miles a gallon. Well, all that they say Team Menard can get is about 1.8 to 1.7. That would make a world of difference. And of course, part of the IRL is that you can work on your own engines. You can take them apart, alter them any way you want, as long as you're within the rules. And so while they're the same engine, in this case, all but one Oldsmobile Aurora engines, they're all massaged, just a little bit different. That can make a world of difference on power, which makes a world of difference on mileage. Well, I'm a little surprised with that concern about mileage. We've had a lot of yellows early, and there's potential for more yellows later, so. Uh, a little surprised that they're that concerned. Well, Tom, don't forget, one of the things that Team Menard likes to do is they try to maintain a thought about track position. That's what they're concerned about. Oh, we got trouble. Turn two. Go yellow once again. Not going to be a good day. That's Ray, Great the 97 Ray. car. And keep an eye on him. Took the nose off the car. Yeah, but he's he's moving around. That's yeah, not a problem. Right. Actually, it looked like there was some spray, some fluid come out of the back of the car just before it started to go around. And, and he was Jack Miller as well became part of that. That's the 40 car. Jack's okay. 
In fact, the car may be okay. He may have just gotten down on the uh, warm-up road, getting back to the racetrack. Well, there's there's Greg. He's moving around. It doesn't look like any problem. He's got the steering wheel off, sitting on the dash, missing some of the parts in the front of the car. Right, so in the background, you're hearing the IRL command channel. Innovation they started last year. The team say they love it. It lets everybody on the track know exactly what's going on. Gregory climbs out of the car. He's okay. Pace car gets the field back in order. The other thing that was happening, actually, Robbie Buell was really slowing down, and he was just right behind the accident when it did happen. Again, you can see the black car here. You can see the smoke coming out of the back of the car, and then it just, uh, probably in his own oil, the thing jumped sideways. The tire coming across the racetrack. Again, Scott Goodyear had uh, one of the best views of this one. Well, and you can see the smoke right there coming out of the back of the car. Uh, some kind of motor problem that let the fluids get to the outside of the motor, and it needs to be on the inside. It looked on that first replay, too, like uh, Jack Miller came flying by low and had to dodge a tire and wheel assembly, and that's what got him down low. Let's well, go you, to Jack. You saw the wheel go across the racetrack. Well, Tom, you were talking about the fact that Robbie Buell was slowing down. Here's what's happening. I talked to John Menard, who was in contact on the radio with Robbie. It seems that the car is snapping out of third gear. So what that means is you hit the throttle, all of a sudden it goes, whoa! So he's got to try and slam it back in. John says that's why the car stutter stepped there at that point. Well, and that that can really be a, a problem for a driver because you have the car all loaded up and when it jumps out of gear, it frees the car up and really upsets the uh, handling balance of the chassis. Go back and take a look at uh, the incident that caused this, the third caution of the day in slow motion. You can see him slowing down. He knows he's got a problem. You can see him getting out of the throttle. And then the smoke comes out of the back of the thing. He's slowed down, but he can't get it slow enough, quick enough, before uh, there's a lot of stuff on the racetrack. Now he's just hanging on. Probably got his eyes shut. And Knocks the left front. By the left front comes across the racetrack, and that's probably what caused uh, the doctor's problem, trying to dodge some of that debris. Yeah, but they've got him started, and he'll head back to the pits, check his tires for debris, and... Jack Miller will be back into the fight. There's Epcot Center, not far from here, just off of turn three on this trioval at Walt Disney World Speedway. You think this place is just for kids? Try hitting Epcot sometime. Tony Stewart leads under yellow. Walt Disney World is constantly growing and changing so much more than a theme park. This is the new wide world of sports complex, about three miles here from the track. It's for the world's top amateur and professional athletes in all sports. The training site of the Atlanta Braves, the Harlem Globetrotters, and events constantly underway over at the wide world of sports area here at Walt Disney World. Tom, you've been over there, you know, throw a few footballs, a little golf. I, I'd like to do a little golf, but uh, throwing footballs could hurt me. Plenty of golf here as well. Well, we're under yellow still as they clean up the track from that. Don't forget next on ABC's why ABC Sports, four of golf's greatest legends play the senior skin game. Jack Nicklaus, Arna Palmer, Hale Irwin, Raymond Floyd. What do you think, Tom? Well, Irwin's probably the youngest of the four. He had a great year last year, but you sort of got in your heart root for Arnie. He's coming back from a bout with cancer. Uh, great story, great guy, and been tremendous for the game of golf. So plenty coming up this afternoon here on ABC. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Paul, there's so many great personality stories about these IRL drivers. Consider the fact that uh, Dr. Jack Miller, who tours all over the country and speaks to students about dental hygiene, well, one of the things that he did at the first IRL race at Walt Disney World, he bought a little baby alligator. All us tourists have done it in the past. He brought it back to his home in Indiana, and it continued to grow and grow and grow. Now it's over four feet long. He was forced to box it up, and he brought it back here and set it loose. He says, we don't need it up in Indiana that size. The bad news is he just had the alligator's teeth gap, so. Uh... <laughs> Probably set it loose uh, down by somebody else's team as well. The rains we've had here, I mean, this place was a day of yesterday, and uh, there's still quite a bit of standing water. That's why the qualifying was rained out, and as a result,
result, they lined up the first 20 in this 28-car field based on points from the entrant from last year. And then the final eight positions, those were all determined by practice speeds because they did get an untimed practice in earlier in the week. We can take a look out of Scott Sharp's onboard camera, Tom, and that gives us a rearward view of that incident. Yeah, well, we're looking out the back and you can see a car, they're dicing behind him. Here's Greg right there. And you can see the smoke come out of the back. He's getting out of the throttle. Everybody else is looking for a place to go. The car just snaps backwards and uh, he's just hanging on. Ray just became a victim in that one. Came out of the throttle, did everything he could. By the way, Scott Sharp has gone from 20th to 8th in just the short distance of green flag we've had. Gary Gerald? And Paul, we were just going to mention, as he's moved up to 8th, he's got plenty of company. Davey Hamilton is back there. Mark Dismore is back there. Those guys have been marching forward along with Jeff Ward. These yellows are helping them pace what they thought was going to be a very hectic effort to not get lapped. Here with the uh, Lazier team, Ron Himmelgarn and company, very, very happy. Buddy currently running in third place, loves the way the car is working. What they're wondering right now is what kind of mileage the leaders are getting because that'll dictate who pits first. Whoever comes in first, probably all the leaders will then follow suit. The Ron Himmelgarn keeps track of his number 91 car. You can see his name on the rear wing of Buddy Lazier's machine there. As we look now down on the uh, the ears, Mickey Mouse, here as part of the track. And of course, the view comes from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. If you want to learn more about blimps, then you can on the internet, www.goodyear.com, and click on At the Controls. You can fly her, huh? Well, we also got Sharp and Cheever that have made some pretty good advancements through the field. Sharp's in eighth, and uh, Cheever's down in ninth. So uh, we got guys moving to the front, and they're actually taking their time and trying to dodge the bullets out there. This is Eddie Cheever, and as he comes around, you'll probably see some of the equipment still out working, trying to get the track clear, because when that engine went, a lot of oil went as well. For guys like Cheever, Scott Goodyear, Scott Sharp, we have a lap and a half to go to Green Tom. It's got to be a nervous start, knowing that you have greater potential, but are way, way back in the field. Well, you're not only way, way back, but you're on a racetrack that's very difficult to pass. Uh, you know, with the short straightaways we talked about earlier, uh, there's just not a whole lot of places to go, and, and you got to be real careful. That coupled with, uh, you know, there's some, some new people out here they're racing against, the first race of the season, uh, a little bit of apprehension, and, and a lot of these guys are using their hands. You saw they took the field down on the warm-up lane so they could continue working clearly up on the racetrack. There is still, coming off a of turn two, quite a bit of oil dry that they're going to leave out there. And as the cars pass over it, you're probably going to see a little bit of dust smoke come up in the air. It shouldn't be a problem. They should be able to track right over it, no problem at all. Well, everybody wants the cars to run through that oil dry to try to get things cleaned up, but uh, you never want to be the first one through there because there's a lot of grit and grind and grub on the racetrack. And, uh, you don't want to be sucking it up through your body you like somebody else to do some of the dirty work. Tom, to end the explanation I was trying to give you about the leader's concerns and fuel consumption, it's strictly about track position. They want to be able to dictate if and when they come in and try and maybe throw the dummy to some others to force them to have to follow suit and then run the others on fuel. Great crowd of race fans stuck with the weather here. They just came to their feet because they know Stewart's going to lead track this year. And Stefan Gregoire back to the green. Well, both of them get a little bit of jump again on uh, Lazier. Boy, Stewart, his restarts, you know, years and years of midget and sprint cars. But still, his restarts are so good. There goes Lazier, the purple number 91 car. Well, Buddy's closed it right up on the back of Breck, so it looks like Buddy's got the handle on that car. This is the battle. The 14 power team car, Kenny Breck driving for A.J. Foyt. Buddy Lazier beginning to work on him now in the Delta Foster. Fight for second. John Paul Jr. is sitting back fourth, but he's back a bit. He's not really in this contest. He's almost two seconds behind this battle. Behind him, group is lined up with Greg Waugh, Boat, Boisel, Sharp, Fever, all of them. You can see that group as they come off the corner. Well, you can see some dicing in the back of that uh, that picture there. Guys are looking for ways around. 
That yellow and purple car in front, that's Jimmy Tide started way in the back. There's Stefan Gregoire. Big question mark on his car. Not sure who their sponsor is going to be. Great way to advertise for a sponsor, isn't it? It really is. That's uh, it's creative. The blue car. Behind the blue car, the now green car in an A.J. Floyd stable, Hunter Green, new colors of Conseco, and Billy Boat at the wheel. You're looking at that battle. Well, a actually, Billy must be having a little bit of a, a handling problem because he sort of flopped back. He was right up there with Ken Greg, the teammates running together real early. Jimmy Kite must be having some problems getting that uh, car, what is really his backup car going. He was in a lot better shape yesterday, but now he's very conscious of traffic moving around him to look back from Sharp. Scott Sharp, his car number eight. Well, the blue and white car is Davey Hamilton. He was happy yesterday in the last practice section. And again, just trying to work through traffic. Oh, look at this group. Sharp, that's Goodyear right behind him. There's Robbie Buell. There's the view from Goodyear. Robbie Buell just ahead. And that was Jeff Ward, the Tabasco car. Over there on the right-hand side, Goodyear takes a low line into the corner. Side by side with Ward. Well, Goodyear, he sort of, there was a little bit of a gap. He looked on the outside, and a bunch of guys went through on the bottom side. Jeff Ward just stuck his nose right in there and went, uh, went on bottom. Plus well, seven miles of the 200 complete, Jack. Paul, you want to know about Jimmy Kite? We checked with his crew. They say that the car's a little bit loose, and they will wait until the first pit stop, which now should come around lap 7-0 to 8-0. On the end car, you saw uh, Goodyear actually shift gears as he was going down that straightaway. A tight mile oval. I, I didn't expect them to be shifting gears, but uh, it could be a mileage situation. Maybe we can get back on board with Scott Goodyear and watch him for a while. Eddie Cheever for the pit sounded like the power was off. Well, we got a yellow. Yellow comes out. It's on fire. Cheever's got you can a fire see on right the back there. of his car. Fourth yellow of the day. And so Eddie this, was a cause for his own yellow. Yeah, we want to stay in the track and make sure there is nothing else. And it looks like Eddie Cheever clearly the cause of the yellow. You can still see it back in the back. She just sort of puffed. That probably means that uh, the side of that engine block's got some ventilation in it that it wasn't designed. Maybe everybody over the winter said, you know, we could tweak these a little more. And, Paul, that's a tremendous break for guys like Goodyear because Tony Stewart had closed up to within about three seconds of that pack. He was looking at an opportunity to put them a lap down. Now he's going to have to go to work all over again. Big break for Goodyear and company. I don't know if you saw Eddie. Just before they unbelted him out of the car, you could see uh, the heavy breathing. You know, first race of the year, um, he was working pretty hard out there. So Eddie Cheever out of the car. You look back from his car, but I doubt that that one is going to get restarted. It may, though. Let's not put the nail on him yet. We'll return with more of the Indy 200 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Green working on the stretch between one and two for the first time. Tony Stewart leads it, followed by Brack Lazier. John Paul Jr. is sitting back there in fourth place, and Stefan Gregoire is in fifth position. So as a result of Eddie Cheever's engine fire, they went yellow, got it cleaned up, back racing once again. Stewart is pulling away, but not as far as before. He's only managed to pull out six tenths of a lap on second place Kenny Breck who is battling with the zero at the same time in the laps that they've had since the green flag came out. Looking back now at the fight for fourth, John Paul Jr., the number 18, that black car, the red trim on the right front wing. And behind him is Stefan Gregoire, the number 77. Tom calls it the blue car. They were so proud of that. They've been calling it the blue car. Well, John Paul's a good story. You know, they really struggled through practice, didn't do much testing. Uh, this winter because the team, the PDM team, the Ford Am Mechanics, uh, don't have a whole lot of money to spend. Eddie Cheever out, Jack Arucha there. Yes, I am, Paul, and so is Eddie. Not where you wanted to be. What caused the engine fire? Did it break? Definitely not where I wanted to be. The car was running really well. We had to start a long way back because it rained in qualifying. I would have liked to defend it. The race that we had last year, but something broke. I don't know what it is. Eddie, you've had a chance to measure the rest of the competition out there. Outside of a Tony Stewart, are there any surprises? Wait a second. 
That's one of the things, Paul, about these new engine combinations. <laughs> you can't hear yourself down here. You've had a chance to look at some of the other competition out here. Any surprises today, Eddie? No. I thought that um, the pace was pretty busy at the beginning. The track is very green because it rained, and a lot of people were hesitant. I had a very good car. It was running well. We moved away up the field. I wish I was out there and not talking to you. I like you, but I'd much rather be out there. And, Paul, one of the things we'll hear a lot with this new engine formula, what'd you say? What'd you say? Yeah, exactly. Nice and loud. You know, we, we probably should exercise a little caution. We suggested it was an engine on Cheever as we watched Billy Cole working on Stefan Gregoire battle for fifth place. But it was fairly aft. It, it might have been more alongside the gearbox or one of the half shafts. So we'll qualify that a little bit later as Jack Aroot and Gary Gerald roam the pits and find out exactly what goes wrong with the car now, which what? is sometimes occasionally different than what they say is wrong with the car. Well, last year at this time, you definitely say an, it's an engine problem, but, uh, you know, they've got the reliability way up on the motor stuff. But in so doing, they work them a little harder. They're turning them a little more RPM this year. They've got a 10-5 limit, and, and all the guys are, uh, you know, flirting with that rev limiter. They're running the engines a little bit harder, trying to get that little bit extra out of them. Now a three-way battle for a fifth on the back stretch. Billy Bode looks to the inside of Stefan Gregoire, can't get it done. You mentioned Tom, he's got to come off of this corner hut. If he wants to run well, that white car is Raul Boisel. Well, there's just no room here, but uh, Billy makes a good job. He poked his nose in there the corner before, let the guy know he was there, and then he went on by in the next corner. Nice job by Billy. And you were wondering whether Billy Bolt might have a problem, might be slowing down a little bit. I went to A.J. Boyd. I said, A.J., how's he doing? He says, good. I say, he's slowing down. He says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> now the battle is between Gregoire and Boisel. Boisel in that white number 30. Look for a second like he had a shot at getting alongside Gregoire. And Gregoire, in fact, was running a higher line at the time. But then I think he became aware of Raul behind him and uh, moved down. Well, Raul's got a, a lot more experience uh, in these Indy cars than a lot of drivers out there. So he isn't going to make a real stupid mistake anywhere in the near future. Battle continues. Got a glimpse from time to time of Mike Groff back there as well. Right, Mr. Jonathan Bird. The guy who at this time last year had a great race, finished second. And then ran into injury problems. Might have had a championship had it not been for those injury problems. Tony Stewart, of course, he is the Indy Racing League champion. We got a yellow. yellow we got on. a yellow. See that yellow flash Coming on. off of turn one. It looks like Stan Waddles. Stan Waddles. Rush the wall with the left rear. Well, he had to get around 360 to get the left rear into the wall, so unless that thing, something back there just broke and got him in trouble. Fifth yellow of the day, only 65 laps, 65 miles complete. Stan was running 15 when he got into trouble coming off of turn one. Brian Howard, the starter, the command channel ordering the pace car out to the field. Now the pits are closed, and once they open them, we kind of expect the leaders to head into the pits. Here's the view from the wall cam. Well, this is coming out of turn one. Oh, he's got about a half spin, and then gets the left rear into the wall. The car just jumped a little bit sideways coming off. That means he's probably loose, and, and you're out of the throttle at that point, trying to get back after the throttle. If you get after it too hard, and the back end's a little bit loose, you can run into trouble. Remember, too, that the, the guys have kind of complained that sometimes the back end doesn't really telegraph where it's going, that it'll just jump out on you. Well, drivers, if you, if you have a condition, uh, you'd rather have the front end uh, in a push condition because the driver gets a little better warning. He feels that quicker. If the back end's loose, a lot of times you just think it's neutral. You try to hustle the car a little bit, and it's going to jump out from under you. Tony Stewart leads the field behind the pace car, and they should open the pits next time by, and that should send Tony Stewart into the pits. Interesting list of cars out. Well, Stewart earlier on one of the yellows raided into the crew and said they look great in their new uniforms, and, and this is a great <laughs> deal for a driver to do. It relaxes them, makes them feel good, gets them ready to do their, their first pit stop of, of the season, and, and it's it's pretty sharp move for a young driver. Key point, first stop. 
first competition stop for many of these teams. Robbie Groff, Roberto Guerrero, Marco Greco, Greg Ray, Eddie Cheever, Stan Waddles all out of the run in the first 67 laps. And Paul, when Tony Stewart comes on to pit road, we can alert the viewers to the fact that nothing will happen other than taking on fuel. Larry Curry and the crew have also checked with Tony and said, do you want to make any changes? And he said, no, he said the last three laps before the caution came up, the car started to tighten up. But other than that, it's literally perfect. So they said, well, let's slap some new tires on it at 35 gallons of methanol, and that'll be it. So right now, let's watch as nothing takes place. <laughs> Front five cars all came in. Now oh, they're doing a little something, Jack. got a little bit of a slow stop. You can see he came in second, whoa, but he's not whoa, leaving. Whoa, oh, we whoa. got trouble. Robbie Buell. Robbie Buell he was coming out of the Menard pits down at the far end, and that's Raul. Raul Boisel, the white car. No question about it this time. I'm down here if you want Jack, Paul, I can you're, tell you're you close. What's... Tell, how's, how can the cars get going again, you think? Well, Paul, the problem is they're literally hung up. The front nose of Robbie Buell's car has been wedged underneath Raul Boisel. Other than that, there isn't a lot of harm to either vehicle. So now the problem is the safety crews have got to come to work and try and unhook one or the other. Now they're moving Buell away. Both should be able to get straightened away, but it's going to be costly. And Raul's still in a pretty precarious position, sitting sideways. He's not going to be able to back that car away. Now the safety crew is there. And their hesitation, of course, is that right behind him, well, you see there is the lane that everybody uses to exit the pits. Well, you can see him exiting the pit right here. There's a lot of traffic. Close call there between Hamilton and Billy Boat. The white car. Bozell. Oh, he goes inside. He goes inside. Robbie Beals pitted right at the end of the pit wall. Him and Stewart there together. Bozell goes inside to get around uh, a slower car in the exit, and, and Beals got nowhere to go. Well, that was Kenny Breck coming out. Hard to think, you know, unless he was being very conscious of the pit speed limit, which is a bit slower here than it has been as a result of the uh, 28 pits that they've laid out. They're trying to accommodate everybody they possibly can by having. 28 pits, 31 cars came here. They were trying to get everybody in. Here well, comes Breck out, yeah. this will show us. Here something. comes Breck, and for some reason, he, oh, there, Bosell had a head of steam up is the problem. He had to slam in the brakes when Breck pulled right in front of him, slammed in the brakes, turned it left, didn't realize that uh, Buell's exiting his pit lane at the same time, and, and Raul, we, we've got tandem shit. Raul knew that the speed limit zone was about to end, so he's on the throttle at that point. Let's see if they can get him started again. That steam there in the cockpit. That's just uh, moisture off the coolers and the high humidity, wouldn't you think? Paul, uh, Raul it is might be coming from the driver himself. Jack. Well, Paul, Raul is coming out of the car. What's happened, as you can see, is the radiator. If I can get the cameraman to shoot right down here, the radiator has literally come apart on this car. Oh, Raul, no. a very, very difficult way to start your first or finish your first IRL race. Tell us what happened from your perspective. I think it's coming out of the pit. I was in, a, in the fast lane, I think, and uh, somebody just pulled out. I tried to avoid, and uh, another car pulled out. I cannot uh, avoid the A tough break for Bozell and his owner, Dennis McCormick, guys. A uh, 70 mile an hour crash takes him out of the run. Kenny Breck, the car that started all of that, as uh, he was right in the middle when Raul came up behind it. Raul darted to the left got into the side well, of this car, the Manville car of Robbie Buell. We'll be going back to green flag at the conclusion of this lap. And it doesn't look like there's much damage to Robbie. The bad news is that the time he had to spend uh, getting away from Bosell, I think he might have lost a lap. So uh, that could help hurt Robbie's chances for today. 71 laps complete. It'll be 72 as they come back to the green flag. Slower cars ahead of the leader. Jimmy Kite will bring them back to green. But this oh, and another car. Oh, we got trouble. Bo. Billy Bo. It looks like the throttle stuck. He caught that wall pretty head on. That shows you how much rain we've had here. It looked like a hydroplane about that last half of that slide. Though. A 
Again, cold tires. Well, plus very, maybe a stuck throttle. Very, very possible. He might have got it sideways and hit the outside wall. That's why the right rear is missing. Now, is he wondering what went wrong or what he's going to have to say to AJ? Well, I don't think AJ understands that stuff. I'm not sure he's real concerned about AJ right now. He had a pretty good race car. Billy Boat and doing that gets the car nose on in the wall. You can see he's fine. Safety system all work. He's throwing yeah. junk all over the racetrack, so that's going to be a major cleanup on the front straightaway. We've uh, seen a number of accidents here, Tom, and everybody's climbing out, so safety's working. Well, the suit's a little wet. We hope that's just uh, Careful. from the grass area. Up there in the back. There's Billy right there. Uh, he was behind another car. It looked like he actually might have turned it down. Uh, he had a run. Jack? Well, AJ, you've now got a chance to watch the replay. Your perspective. They knew tired and they were just cold. Dermot said it a little bit and jumped out. Are you saying it was a case of terminal dumbness? Huh? Are you saying <laughs> it's a case of terminal dumbness or did he just get on it too hard? Well, I'm glad to see him not hurt. We can do a lot to the car. It just, uh, like I said, they're brand new tires and just a little thermostat it and damn cool day like this. Sometimes they'll jump out from under you. Hey, guys, I ain't going to ask yeah. it again. Yeah, <laughs> running the questions that way, I think we can start a pool on how soon before you are punched out, Mr. Root. <laughs> well, it actually looked like Billy tried to turn under some. He had a run on the guy in front of him, turned it down low, pinched a little bit, tires cold. Cold rear tires, puts them into the wall and puts us under yellow. 74 miles are complete. We'll be back. Well, John, the yellow flag flying a little too much here, and as this yellow came out, an interesting situation developed with John Paul. He made it all the way to the end of the pits, and then the crew ran down to recover him, and they climbed on the car and began working on it while they were pushing him back to his pits. The race buddy, summary. Turn the motor on. Come on, buddy, turn it over, buddy. Leader, Tony Stewart right now, average speed 158 miles an hour. It could be much more if it weren't for those uh, six caution flags for 49 laps of the race. Now 50 laps of the race, 78 run. Let's go down to Jack Aroot. Billy Boat has been re released from the infield care center. And Billy, A.J. Foyt surmised that maybe the problem on that start was the cold tires and having to try and work the throttle a little bit. What actually did happen? Too aggressive on the start, cold tires. I tried to make a pass underneath somebody and just lost it. How much you can say. I feel sorry for Conseco and the, and the team. They did a great job, you know, totally my fault. First season, I mean, beginning of the season type jitters. I mean, are there some things that these drivers, because we're seeing an awful lot of crashes, even though they're all safe, but is it maybe getting some of the cobwebs out for some of these guys? No, it's just hard to pass, and, you know, you're trying to make the best of every opportunity you can out there, and, uh, you know, they're just, it's just tight, not, not much room to pass. A very disappointed Billy Boat, but remember, at this time last year, Billy Boat was wheeling his midget race car. In fact, at the 16th Street Speedway, a couple of days before qualifying at Indy, he got a phone call from A.J. Foyt. So there is the car on the hook. Yep. And he was, as you said, Tom, trying to make a move. Well, he was. That was pretty much an e-ticket ride. And uh, Billy was sort of boating that, actually, at the end of that deal. <laughs> Sunday, February 1st on ABC Sports. Roughest and toughest in the NFL meet in Hawaii. It's the AFC-NFC Pro Bowl. Live, 6 o'clock Eastern. Now you're looking down from the Goodyear blimp, the stars and stripes, the track here in the foreground. Now look up. There just ahead, you can pick out the castle. That's the Magic Kingdom and all the great resorts around here. And a place that grows constantly now with the new downtown Disney and everything. House of Blues is there. But that's the Magic Kingdom. I think Mickey and Goofy are, are here today. All right, the John Paul Jr. story, Gary Gerald. Well, it turned out it was the engine control module. That's one of those infamous black boxes. They've replaced it. It's fired. They're buttoning up the bodywork. They hope to get the uh, PDM crew, get the 18 car of John Paul Jr. right back on track. But I believe we're anticipating green next time by, Paul. Exactly. In fact, the field is over in turn two of this trioval. Tony Stewart will lead them back this time. There he is, car number one, the Glidden car. The one signifying that he is the Pep Boys Indy Racing League champion. 
Buddy Lazier will come to the line in second. And then Davey Hamilton scored in third, followed by Scott Goodyear, Kenny Breck, losing some with that confrontation on the stops, will come back to the line in fifth place. Well, John Paul joined the back of the field, but lost a couple laps. So we go green. Red, white, and blue car is the number six of Davey Hamilton. There he is. He rides in third place. Wants to catch the lead, Stewart, followed by Lazier. On board Goodyear, he's fourth place. Hamilton just ahead of him. You can listen, that was turn three, and you heard the motor not change pitch, and the kitty runs flat out. Entering turn one, you can hear him roll out of the throttle, chasing the steering wheel a little bit. It looked like it might be under steering a little bit in that corner. Scott Goodyear, new team for him. Newly created team, we're on board with him. We'll just ride here with Scott Goodyear. Entering turn three, hear the motor. Not much change in the pitch right there. Here he rolls out of it, getting into the corner. And he has to wait to the exit to try to jump back into that throttle. Got a good run though on Davey. Makes the move on Davey Hamilton, comes to the inside. And moves into third place. Scott Goodyear, brand new team. John Barnes, along with the Indianapolis Colts quarterback, Jimmy Harbaugh, puts together an operation here for Scott Goodyear. Well, I don't think he's mad at it right now. This, thing, this thing's starting to go to the front. Goodyear, 3.7 seconds behind the lead. Barely a second between Goodyear and second place Buddy Lazier. But traffic, again, will become a factor very quickly here. Well, we saw Stewart not make any adjustments on that car, just put on fresh tires in the stop. That's that's one of the advantages of testing. You know, you do your homework and, and you get to the racetrack and you're prepared. It really uh, makes your job on race day a lot easier when you have that kind of preparation. Now, when you look back, there goes Goodyear. He just came around Robbie Buell, who, owing to his problems, has been back in the field, but Goodyear gets bottled up behind Jack Miller. Look oh, down on the inside. Brett. Brett tries to make a move, almost loses it. Kenny Brett trying to close and catch Goodyear as they run through this traffic. Well, I think Brett, they set that thing up for the pavement down on the grass and just doesn't handle it. Well, the way Billy Boat sprayed this main straightaway with dirt here, the question was whether or not they were going to leave the dirt out there and run it as a dirt race. Jack well, Miller will receive the black flag. Did last time he'll receive it again. They're concerned he's running too slow and is part of this battle. Jeff Ward just getting by Davey. So, uh, you know, a couple of guys got by Davey going towards the front right now. That's what makes the miles so great. There's a little momentum. Everybody climbs over the back. They spread out and off they go. Well, they got some great action back here. A lot of passing going on. A lot of dice and traffic stuff. So now Breck and Ward lined up behind Robbie Buell, who is off the pace. Breck looks for room on the inside, darts to the outside, then takes that inside line. Here comes Ward. The blue car is the car. Robbie Buell, the second car in the Menard stable. Jeff Ward working on him, and then that red, white, and blue number six, that's Davey Hamilton. He's in sixth place. You saw Kenny Breck in the middle of the corner there with a the rear wing was uh, wiggling around a little bit there. Track isn't that rough, so I'm not sure what that is. Well, when they run, they run good, but this race has been punctuated with yellows. 90 miles of the 200 mile schedule distance, all that we've completed. This is Scott Sharp. He's yep. in eighth place. Dismore just ahead of him. He thought Sharp would come quicker. Uh, he was actually the quickest in some of the practice sessions before the start of the race with limited practice time. But um, again, just feeling his way around, coming towards the front, but not as fast as I thought. He's actually had some awesome practice time, both in the pre-testing here and in the uh, short practice time we had before they rained out qualifying. Well, it's a new team. This Kelly uh, Automotive, him and Dismore both, uh, Done a nice job. Looked like they're spending some money to get some good finishes under them. Kelly really jumped into this big time, too, has he? He has. He's got a lot of equipment. He has some good personnel. That's what it takes to, to run. All lined together, you see we keep 
track of all of the events. Across the top of the screen, it'll give you the interval back as well as the laps complete. The blue and white car there was Davey Hamilton. You're inside Sharp's car here. Right in front of him is his teammate. Uh, Biggest go-kart dealer in the world, Mark Dismore. Outside Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, wow, that's some of the greatest training for, for a race driver. Probably uh, the most economic way to hold your skills for racing. Dismore's career heavily interrupted with an impact during practice in the 8500 several years ago. Smacked it into the wall off of turn four, shattered his leg. Long recovery. Now Scott Sharp begins to work on him. And they swap positions as Sharp takes the spot away from Dismore. So Sharp now seventh. And will begin to work on sixth place Davey Hamilton. A primarily red and blue car, some white trim just ahead of him, car number six. Davey yes. Hamilton's history. Sharp is definitely rolling. He's starting to work better. He didn't have much trouble with Davey right there. He made that thing look pretty easy. This is going out of the back of uh, Sharp's car. He's running up uh, Jeff Ward right in front of him now with Robbie Bill just in front of that. Try to listen to those radios. We'll switch them where we can as you see the car on the screen. Could have been Sharp's radio, that Delphi car just a moment ago. We're on board again. Jeff Ward taking a look there with uh, Robbie Buell. Buell again with that pit incident is down a lap, so uh, still the car's running well, but the pit incident is uh, causing him some stress. Buell lap off the pace, runs in 12th place. Sharp and Dismore, when they were together, were running 6th and 7th, and Sharp went around Davey Hamilton and moved into 6th place. Whoa, Scott trouble oh, right oh, there. Oh, 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 he got just, him. He got him. Nipped just his leg. <laughs> Here's Scott Sharp on the radio. He's reporting it as well. So there's some chunk of wing out on the... You see right there on the left front, uh, you can hear him talking to the crew. Sharps in there, they go yellow. I'm sure as a result of the debris, there is Buzz Calkins comes into the pits just behind him. Robbie Buell slowed just a bit. Scott was right there, caught his right rear. I'm surprised that there wasn't a problem with uh, Buell's car when he got into him. Well, inside Sharp, you see Buell really has to, for whatever reason, is trying to get out of the way. Sharp doesn't quite see him quick enough, tries to get outside, but just catches the front wing. Lucky they didn't get tires together because that could really cause some And problems. Jack Sharp couldn't jump really out of the way because Ward was just outside him. That's one of the problems, as we said at the top of the show, when you're running on a one-mile tight bull ring. For Scott Sharp's crew, though, they're going to change the front nose. Now, the right side's not too badly damaged, but the left side, there's literally maybe a third cut away from that accident. Paul Page at Walt Disney World Speedway. There it is laid out before you from the overhead shot, courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. This Goodyear will double its fleet of blimps to six, adding two more blimps in Europe and one in South America. Next on ABC Sports, four of golf's greatest. They play the Skins game, the Senior Skins. Jack Nicklaus, Arnie Palmer, Hale Irwin, and Raymond Floyd. Coverage begins next here on ABC. Now, we're getting ready to go back to the green flag. Tony Stewart, still the leader. Buddy Lazier in second place. Scott Goodyear with a nice run in the recent green flag laps moves up to third. Kenny Breck driving for A.J. Foyt in the 14 car. He's now in fourth. And Jeff Ward with a nice little run as well, but he almost became part of the incident that caused this yellow, is in fifth place. Rounding out the top ten, Hamilton. Then Dismore, Greg Waugh, Tyler the rookie, and Sam Schmidt. Watching now. Green flag is out. We're ready to go. 
Stewart again leads him in. Battle oh. back there behind him. Ty Carlson bottles up a couple. Well, Lazier, <laughs> Lazier gets in some heavy traffic. He has to roll out of the throttle and uh, really gives uh, Stewart a chance to jump out. With him. Lazier, that number 91 car, and he's working on Ty Carlson just ahead of him. Carlson is, of course, not in the fight. He is off the pace. Now you ride with Goodyear. Goodyear sits in third. Overhauls John Paul Jr. in the clip car. Now he has to deal with Tice Carlson. Tice with a nice new effort this year. They worked their team up. Buddy Lazier now has a clear shot to the leader, Stewart. But Goodyear comes around as well. And Goodyear has a clear shot at Lazier. Next in line will be the 14 car, A.J. Foyt's car with Kenny Breck. They spell it B-R-A-C-K, but from Sweden, pronounce it Breck. On board with Scott Goodyear. You see the 33 on the on the steering wheel. That's a, that's a fuel reading. That's a meter. When he sees that on the dash, he knows he's got to be uh, looking towards that pin area. Harry Darrell with all the trouble. Robbie Buell is down 10 laps behind the race in 19th place. Yeah, and Paul, and it uh, certainly is looking more bleak right now. During that yellow, Buell came in. He had that contact with Goodyear. Apparently, that does not relate to the problem. Somehow, the engine just shut down. So they're going through the routine, checking out all the electronics, but he continues to drop further and further back. A very disappointing day for this half of the Menard team. Tom, earlier, Eddie Cheever is talking about how sophisticated the cars are, but by the same token, how sensitive they are, are they also sensitive? I mean, we had morning rain here and everything. Does that get into the electronics, or do they keep them insulated enough that it doesn't? Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, there's a lot of humidity in the air, and that might be a factor. But as far as physically getting wet, uh, I don't think that would be a problem. Tony Stewart, the reigning Pep Boys IRL champion, comes out very strong this year. He is the leader by two and a half seconds. Back to Davey Hamilton there in the red, white, and blue car see his progress throughout the day. Hamilton with Mike Groff ahead of him. Groff is two laps behind, 13th place. Guys, as you take a look at the field out there, let's give you a little update on what Bill Martin, the crew chief for leader Tony Stewart is doing, along with Larry Curry. We said that they made a pit stop and literally did nothing in terms of adjustments. Well, what they're doing is on board, they are trying to talk Tony through some minor adjustments, Tom Sneva, little changes to try and make the car work just a little bit better. I guess you could kind of call that taking nothing and tweaking it. Well, the good news is when you only have to worry about little things, uh, there's not big gaps to catch. You know the car's close, and uh, Tony's probably got a little smile on his face right now. Well, we're going to try a little something here. You know, the get a lot of uh, interest in the drivers themselves, who they are, what they do away from racing. And yet we don't have quite enough time in every race to be able to show you that without covering over the green flag. So we're going to continue watching the race while we talk a bit about Tony Stewart, who has been racing competitively since the age of 12. Along with his IRL crown, he's the only driver to win three USAC titles in the same year. He has a very clear understanding of the danger. Here's Gary Gerald. Without question, Paul, Tony knows the dangers involved in his livelihood. Getting out of bed in the morning is a risk. Uh, driving down to the grocery store is a risk. Uh, you know, at least the guys I'm with have experience on the road. They're all going, we're all going the same direction, hopefully. And, you know, you know that the risks are there. Despite the risk of the sport, the competitive fires within Stewart burn brightly and with startling intensity. It doesn't matter whether it's you know, messing around with mini bikes in my backyard or four wheelers or race cars. Uh, I always want to beat the next guy. And, and as long as there's two or more people out there, there's always somebody wanting to go faster than somebody else. And that's, that's from day one what it's been all about to me. Last May, he came to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for only the second time. After setting on the pole as a rookie, Tony once again started on the front row. He led the most laps, finished fifth, but it was his head-to-head -head duel with Ari Leyendijk that captured the attention of IRL fans everywhere. Was this the start of a budding rivalry? You know, we get along fine. You know, he, he talks about things he's done in the past. He asked me about things I've done in the past, and uh, 
really there is no rivalry. I just think it's two guys that are always pushing to win each week, and, and it always seems like it's you know between one of the two of us. So I think that's where that came from. In far too many events, Stewart and Team Menard experience misfortune, often leading but without a win, until finally breaking through at Pikes Peak in the Colorado 200. I've won a lot of races and, and sprints and midgets and silver crown cars, and to be able to give Team Menard and John Menard their first win was uh, a feeling that I'll never forget to see all the joy on, the, on their faces, uh, to finally say, hey, we finally got one. There's, there were so many times that we, we should have won races and we were in positions to win races and couldn't capitalize that it was finally nice to see that, that we got one locked down and under our belt and finally got the monkey off our back. A commitment to run Bush Grand National cars this season has only added to an ever-expanding challenge. When we ran sprint cars and midgets and silver crown cars, you'd run a, a dirt midget race one night, and the next day you may be in a sprint car on pavement, and you had to learn to adapt. And learning to adapt when you move up to another series, it just gives you a head start on the learning curve. We've always accomplished the goals we've wanted, and it's been hard doing it, and we've been very lucky to be able to do it. But uh, I'm sure there's going to be a day when that might happen. But. Until then, we're going to keep pushing as hard as we can. And, uh, trouble we'll right for the leader. Trouble for the leader. Tony Stewart tries to drive through some debris on the back stretch as we've got a car up against the wall, and the yellow comes out again at the 123rd lap. Well, that's Brian Tyler, the, the rookie that was doing such a great job, uh, got in trouble on the exit of one. Report from some of the spotters is that Salazar ran into the back of this car. Salazar would then have been involved in two incidents today. The first one, and now this one. And because they did get Salazar restarted, and we go yellow once again. As we were watching Tony Stewart down in the smaller box on your screen, you saw the debris suddenly bounce all over the place. And you might have to check his tires because he looked like he got into it heavily. There he is, though. No question. That happened, uh, the accident happened right in front of the leader. You can see the debris in the racetrack. And as you watch that accident, guys, the one thing that Tony Stewart quickly got on the radio and said is, I think I ran through some stuff. Very calmly, his crew chief, Bill, says, hey, don't worry about it. We're going to want to pit anyway. Coming off the corner, something happens with Tyler. The thing just slows down. When he slows down, he does get run into the back of by Salazar, and that turns him sideways into the wall right in front of the leader. But uh, something caused Tyler now, to have to get Salazar. out of the throttle. Look at the nose there, Tom. Yeah, and, and again, the nose of that car, uh, something happened to Tyler's car. He had to run out. Well, let's go to Jack. Well, new sponsor, new confidence for Robbie Buell, but still the same old problem. What put you out of the race? Well, it was just one of those days we did have a lot of problems, and uh, it's too bad. A new car, the blue with John's Manville. Um, we don't know. The motor just shut off, uh, but the race just kind of started bad. Robbie Groff spun in us. Then uh, our car was jumping out of gear into turn one, and it was just kind of never-ending. So we'll get it out of our system and be ready for Phoenix. And you know, guys, he wants to get it out early because not only Phoenix, but the road to Indy, as you said, Paul, starts right here today. Yeah, and there is one of the guys that's very definitely in the fight for the Indy 500, Eliseo Salazar, with a cobbled-up nose now heads on to the pit road. We'll return with more of the Indy 200 after this message and a word from our ABC station. But John, we're still under yellow here. Uh, most of the leaders made stops on that yellow. Tony Stewart, of course, though, stays as the leader, followed by Goodyear, Lazier, Hamilton, and Ward. That's the top five for you. As you look down on the uh, track, here is the way Scott Sharp saw it. Well, that's a little bit late. You really couldn't tell there that uh, Tyler had to get out of the throttle or something caused the motor to turn off, and uh, it surprised uh, the Reebok car it got it. Uh, I guess that'd be the toe of the Reebok car. Well, not some the indication, of course, was that uh, Eliseo Salazar in that number 15 Reebok car did slow down. Don't forget great entertainment tonight on ABC. A new episode of Nothing Sacred starring Kevin Anderson. Tonight, 8, 7 Central. And now they're putting them back in single file behind the pace car as our 8th Yellow of the day will come to conclusion. One of the many golf courses here. There are five different 18-hole championship courses. One's a nine-hole course. That's Oak Trail. 99 total holes here on the Disney property. That and means a lot of bogeys if yes, there's it that does. many holes. Yes, it does. How many mulligans you give me on 99 holes? 30? 35? 
that that still wouldn't be enough. Wouldn't be anywhere near it. 129 at 200 laps complete. That's the way they'll come back to the green flag. And generally, they are they're not in that order because Tony Stewart is about halfway down the lineup as the leader of the race. Yeah, that's going gonna, to the stop. It's going to make an exciting restart because of the pit stops. We've got a lot of the. Uh, slower cars in front of the leaders, so it should make for some interesting passing. Buzz now. Calkins brings them back to the green flag. There is Stewart. See how far back he is? He comes outside. Salazar, Goodyear, and Lazier both close right in. Battle three cars. Lazier. Lazier, look at him. He moves to the outside. On the outside of Goodyear in turn one. That's a nifty little pass. 131 laps into the record book. With that as the number, it's doubtful that they could go to the 200th lap without another pit stop. Well, you see, this look, at the, mark. You look at the action there, right in front of the Goodyear's car. Sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Use this as the mark. They say, that's Team Menard, that they need at least 11 more caution Whoa. laps. And then Whoa, they'll be able to go the distance. Oh, the leader of the Some race. Great race in there, Cycling, back and forth. Traffic, and look at that, Goodyear catches the outside wall, just crushes it. Yellow comes out again. Goodyear may be able to actually drive it in. Well, he can drive it in, but it looks like he's got some right front damage there. Nine yellow flags now, 133 laps. Boy, some great, great racing yeah, on, down the back straightaway. When they get going, unbelievable. Four, like monitoring both Scott Goodyear's radio and we're monitoring the command channel from the Indy Racing League. You see the wheel cam out, they think they're done. Yeah, you could just hear it on the radio and Goodyear's coming out now. He threw the wheel out onto the cover, climbs out of the car, gets congratulations from the crew and comes toward us. Oh boy. And Gary, the um, the spotters are saying that there's quite a bit of marbles, you know, gummed up rubber on the outside of turn two where he just got high and brushed the wall. Well, there's Tice Carlson right in front of him, so it looked like he was trying to get, he actually probably got in Tice's uh, air wake a little bit, got up uh, into what we call the marbles and uh, had, couldn't keep it out of the wall. So he climbs out of the car. Gary Gerald's going to stay right there close to him. Well, here's the kind of racing that was going on in the back straightaway. You see uh, he's up out of the groove right now, but he's just up in the marbles, and he can't turn the thing. And if the car's got a little bit of understeer, you get up in the marbles, uh, the rubber from uh, from the tires throughout the race. Uh. Gary, you're well, with Scott. Scott, tell us what happened there. You get up on that gray stuff, it's so hard to save it. Well, yeah, I got pushed up in that gray stuff um, going on the outside, actually, and uh, the black car, I think it was Lion Dyke, just uh, obviously didn't know I was there and just turned and moved me up into the gray stuff, which is the marbles, the rubber off the tires, and you get no grip there. And it was one of those slow, very slow, smooth things where you hope you're going to catch it, but there's too much rubber up there. And this came off a sensational 11-second pit stop, put you right in there behind Tony Stewart. Did you feel you had things coming together where you were going to be able to win this race? Well, I think we had a good chance. Uh, everybody on the Panther pack team did a great job. I mean, that stops have been great and uh, just changed some stagger on the car, and we kept working with the car to get it working. I think it was working pretty good. A lot of laps obviously left, so you don't want to get too anxious, sit back and run. But, you know, I'm disappointed for everybody at Penzo and Northern Telecom. We had a good team here today. Thanks, Scott. Jack? Well, Gary, Brian Tyler's checked out of the infield medical care facility. And, Brian, first of all, you okay? And what happened? Uh, I'm all right. Um, I'm not sure if it was electrical or fuel. Just coming off the corner, it shut off, and somebody got in the back of me and turned me into the fence. So. Well, as part of the being a sprint car champion for USEC, you were actually given a test ride. And you went through all that, and then you went on vacation, and the phone at home kept ringing by the Chitwood brothers, and it what took three days for them to find you and offer the ride that you got Tuesday. Yeah, it took a couple days for them to track me down through Florida and stuff, and uh, they ended up finding me at a friend of mine's, and we put the deal together late Tuesday night, and here we are. And you know, I'd like to thank Joey and everybody and for all the work they've done, and they put a good car under me, and I was just trying to get some laps and get used to being in traffic, and you know, just figuring out pit stops and. And learn, and learn, Paul. And he learned very well, even though he didn't finish. We're glad he's okay. While we were focusing the accident, Buddy Lazier stuck by Stewart and took the lead. We'll be back. Back at Walt Disney World Speedway with Buddy Lazier, the new leader, just taking the green flag. He's being chased by Tony Stewart and Davey Hamilton. 
completing that first lap after green. So up the top speed now, 140 lap will be in the record book as Lazier crosses the line. Well, and I think we'll go back and catch how uh, Lazier did get by Stewart. You can see right here, uh, traffic, the leader, Stewart comes up on traffic, has to check it up a little bit, and uh, Lazier didn't hesitate. He just pounded her down to the inside and got a run on, uh, on Stewart down the front straightaway. Made a great pass in a, a tight situation. And Stewart got caught up behind Ari Leyendijk, two-time Indy champion. Remember, he had problems early on. They had to change the whole nose and front wing assembly on that car. But the question now, with 141 lap complete, Jack, do we have enough yellow to get to the end of the race? According to Bill Martin, the crew chief for Tony Stewart, the answer is, Paul, yes, absolutely yes. He gave us a thumbs up signal, said they're going to try and go the distance without a stop. And Jack, over here in the Buddy Lazier pit, we just asked Ron Himmelgarn the same thing. He wouldn't commit to an answer. That tells me they're worried. Now, you had said, Jack Arut, that they needed 11 laps of, of uh, yellow in a green interval there, and they actually ran 15, so you would think that would give us enough both for the Menard car of Tony Stewart and for the Himmelgarn car of Buddy Lazier, but Ron Himmelgarn's usually pretty open. I wonder if this signals something. Jeff Ward, currently fourth. Ahead of him is Hamilton, behind him is Dismore. Dismore's done a nice job. We haven't said too much about it, but he's been working in the, in the wings, and uh, the car looks good at this stage in the race. Well, that whole new team is a great opportunity for him and Scott Sharp. I mean, it, he's in some equipment he hasn't seen the likes of in his racing career, and I'm sure he's going to make the most of it. Good racing driver. No question about that. We talked about the, uh, the go-kart uh, reference, and, and that experience has been a big help to him. Guys, you talk about Mark Dismore, the reason and the way he got his ride this year started when he was out shopping for a ride for last year's Indy 500. The, the, the people that he's now driving for said, well, look, we know where there's some unassembled engines. We'll get together with you, get you those engines. And they got so excited about their effort at Indy that they said, hey, we're going to start an IRL team in 1998. Want to drive? Well, there's no question that the IRL has presented some great opportunities for some talented drivers. We got Le Lazier leading the race. You know, he caught Stewart in traffic, uh, but since that's happened, uh, Stewart really hasn't been able to close the gap or make a big challenge on Lazier for the last uh, five or ten laps. Does he know something about Lazier's fuel as well and has just decided to sit there and stay in touch? Well, we're going to see how this pans out. Now, sure. He's inching forward, and now they're coming up on some traffic. Well, we talked about that earlier. Uh, the key to this racetrack is traffic. You've got to get some brakes, and you've got to anticipate. And that's part of the driver's job is being able to predict and anticipate what might happen before it actually does. 31 cars came here to compete at Walt Disney World Speedway. 28 made it into the race. 11 are now out. Look at that move. Yeah, that was a pretty swoopy. Uh, he just turned the thing down and... Uh, drove right underneath. He'll drive that thing anywhere he wants. Eleven are out. Of those eleven, eight of them are as a result of accidents. Fortunately, no injuries. Of the eight running at the front of this field, five are looking for their first IRL win. Lazier, Stewart, Hamilton, Ward, Dismore. Those are the top five. 150 miles complete, 50 to go. We'll be back. Well, John, while we've been away, we've had a nice little stint of green flag racing, though it hasn't had an impact on the standings. Buddy Lazier is still leading Tony Stewart. You see Lazier moving around Eliseo Salazar. And then you get a glimpse from time to time. There he is. John Menard's car, that bright yellow number one of Tony Stewart. And sitting about six tenths of a second back rather consistently. The question, of course, is fuel. Now, Tony Stewart's crew has said, fuel's not a problem for us. We can go the whole way. Then we heard Ron Hemmelgarn hesitate at that. And then Gary Gerald reported that Lee Koonsman, who is the, uh, the crew chief there, he said, well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe we need a little help. Well, there's a big question mark on that 
Number 91, Delta Foster car. Well, the other thing that's happening besides fuel mileage is Stewart's having to hustle the car now to try to keep up with Lazier. And hustling the car, he's starting to heat up the right front. The car's starting to pick up a little bit of a push. Probably the first time today that he's really had to work the car uh, harder than he'd like. In doing so, he's uh, heating up that right front. And Tom, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what Tony Stewart was discussing with his team. Well, if you're tuning in for the Skins game, going to be a little bit delayed here, Senior Skins. Uh, we've got uh, a little counterpoint to the tranquility of the golf course with Walt Disney World, the Indy Racing League, and a 200-mile race with about 44 miles to go. And believe me, they'll run that down quickly. We've had a lot of yellows, nine yellow flags here, caution periods, accidents. The battle has pretty much remained at the front of the field, and that battle has been won that is primarily between Tony Stewart and Buddy Lazier, but Tom, we're seeing a change in the order come about now. Well, I don't know where that's coming from, but uh, Scoring's got Ward and Dismore up front. Yeah, and I looked up at the monitor, I, I looked away for just a second, I know I shouldn't do that, and suddenly they were showing an entirely different top of the order, but nothing's changed. That's the leader, Buddy Lazier, car number 91. Tony Stewart in second, Davey Hamilton in third, Jeff Ward is back and forth. Well, we got a good race going on between Ward and uh, Davey Hamilton right now for that position, so uh, that's heated up. Oh, Whoa. we got problems. The leader. leader, the leader's in trouble. Lazier gets into the fence, bouncing it off the wall. We go yellow again, and Buddy Lazier. Now remember, here's a man who's had... I'm in the wall. That's the leader. Leader's I rated. Can't get a gear, so I can't get back. I'm in the wall. Stay That's in. Ron Hemmelgarn. He's listening right, to the radio right, report of Buddy Lazier. And you're listening, of course, to two-way radio of Buddy Lazier. Sorry, guys. Dri hey, guys, I'm really sorry. We had a great race car today. You heard him. That's the driver. They had a great race car. So Ron Hemmelgarn. His what wife. disappointment. Yeah, his new wife, Kara, just got married last fall. And don't forget, Buddy Lazier has suffered two years ago some terrible, there's Kara, some terrible back injuries. And well, he's not the, he's not hurt, Paul. He's more concerned about uh, destroying that race car and, and his chances for the victory. So the crew stays right there, keeping a track, making sure that they can get him out safely and won't create any more injury to his back. Tony Stewart picks up the lead. As the pits come open here, they shouldn't be used by any of the leaders now. Davey Hamilton is in second. In the third place is Jeff Ward. Mark Dismore is in fourth. Coming up will be the senior skins, and of course, we'll be here for the conclusion of the 200 here at Walt Disney World. So stay with us. It's Paul Page, we're back at Walt Disney World Speedway. Buddy Lazier is now empty car. He was leading the race. He took the race away from race leader Tony Stewart. And here's what happened. Well, you can see him right here. He's back. He's high in the groove. And for some reason, the back end just jumps out. Now, I don't know if the air off the car right in front of him caused him any uh, kind of little hiccup, but something caused that car to jump side. Is it the front one or the... Here's Buddy right here. Second car in this line. He's trying to get by uh, the blue Greg car. Watt. Yeah. Trying to find a way around, and I don't know if he had to roll out of the throttle and then jump back in the throttle, but something caused the back end to jump out. It looks like exactly what happened, looking down from above. Again, leader of the race. That car in the upper right-hand corner, that's Stewart. Right there, Stewart. There's Buddy, the second car in line there. He's looking for a way around Gregoire. He tried underneath, couldn't make that happen, then looked to the outside and... Uh, I think you're right. I think he just, he came up on Gregoire pretty quickly. He had to lift, and the back end jumped out when he did. Well, that's what it looks like at this point. So we're getting ready to go racing again. Don't forget, we're going to keep uh, Senior Skins coming up for you as well. And if you're a golfer just joined us here, I think you might like mile racing with the Pep Boys Indy Racing League, so stay with us as well. Paul, they just asked Tony Stewart, asked his crew, how many laps to go? They said just about 30. He says, well, then it's short track Saturday night. So as we come back to the green flag, Mark Dismore is the race leader. Stefan Gregoire is second. Tony Stewart, who went into the pits, made sure he had plenty of fuel, is back out.
out in third. Davey Hamilton is fourth. Jeff Ward is fifth. He's got some traffic to get through. Uh, trying to work his way back towards uh, the position he wants to be in. And normally we'd be giving you a banner across the top of the screen showing you all the positions, but the, the scoring system has taken a hiccup from the Indy Racing League. And so as a result, we can't do that electronically. I'll try to keep you updated. Dismore, Gregoire, Stewart, Hamilton, Ward. There's Stewart, that bright yellow, number one. In front of him, the blue car, Stefan Gregoire. Second place. Stewart works on second. Gregoire continues to hold him. Question mark on the side of the blue car is because they don't have a sponsor and they love one. Well, baby Hamilton's right behind Stewart now. Gregoire's running quick, but the straightaways, again, are so short, it doesn't give a guy much of a run to try to get by. Passing's very tough. Entering two. A lot of different grooves going into two, and uh, Tony was able to get the lower groove and make a pass. The yellow car of Tony Stewart now moves into second place. The 28 car of Mark Dismore is now his target. Gregoire back to third. Davey Hamilton will begin working on Gregoire now. He was right in there. Well, and Jeff Ward is working on Hamilton. We just saw that at the end of that last shot. So a fight through the top five here as the laps roll away. Subtitle could be Shanks for the memories. <laughs> golfer yourself, Tom. Who you're? Uh, well, more than the golfer, you own a course or two. Senior skins. Who are you looking at? Well, you got to pull for Arnie. You know he's coming through about with cancer and stuff. He sort of made this sport what it is today. And uh, but you know, Hale Orman had a great year in the senior tour last year. But uh, I'm sort of going to be pulling for Arnie. Davey Hamilton, the fourth place car. He's at blue and red car. And Jeff Ward right behind him with a background in motocross racing. Great motocross champion, in fact. Now making his mark here in the Pet Boys Indy Racing League. Well, that Tabasco car is putting more heat on Davey Hamilton than uh, Davey would like. Right I'll tell you what, this battle's just become serious as he closes in. At the same time, that blue car, the third place is Stefan Gregoire. There he goes. Little puff of smoke from Greg Wash car. Let's hope it's not an engine getting ready to go. Well, you can see Ward, he's taking a lot of looks at Davey. He's putting uh, more pressure than Davey wants right now on uh, that position. Yeah, and Davey at the same time, he saw what we saw. He saw that puff of blue smoke. He's got to be thinking, I don't want to get too close up under this guy. But then again, I can't very well lay back because Ward's all over me. Well, sometimes when you see smoke in front of you, you'll feather put that thing a little bit. And, uh, Davey uses his head. He's smart. Gregoire, Hamilton, and Jeff Ward. This is really a battle for third place. No contact at the front of the field with 20 laps, 20 miles to go. The question starts coming is uh, Dismore got the fuel to go the rest of the way, Jack or Gary? The leader. We don't know about that's Mark Dismore. We do know about Stewart. He came in, he topped off, but a number of the teams were concerned about refueling their cars on that final pit stop, which has taken place in a way that would get them to the finish. Now, some of them, there's Mark Dismore, he might be one of them, might be trying to stretch it. Well, you're going to see uh, this yellow car in the picture real shortly because he's closed the gap on Mark substantially. He's just right behind this car right now. And, Paul, isn't there an irony to the fact that Tony Stewart brought his car onto pit road during that last caution strictly as a precaution, saying maybe we need to take on just a little bit of fuel because right from the get-go and for, what, the last 60 laps or so, they've maintained that they had plenty of fuel. Well, better safe than sorry. Or I needed fuel, I just didn't tell you about it. Stewart now begins to work on the leader, Mark Dismore. We suggested 20 miles. That's not far. Not far, not long. Well, the problem is if Stewart's got that pushing condition we talked about a little earlier, he can close the gap, but when he gets up behind Dismore, uh, that takes the air off the front wings on uh, Stewart's car. It'll compound his handling problem and make the car push even worse. And uh, Chris comes your cousin some stress trying to get by Dismore. Yep. You see when he tucks up tight, 
uh, the middle of the corner. He has to roll out of the throttle. He can't get back after it on the exit, and uh, Dismore gets away by a couple car lengths. Yeah, Dismore is handling much better than Stewart at this point. 15 laps to go. Well, he's only better in fresh air. When Tony's got fresh air, he closes the gap. He comes right back to him. But when he gets behind him, again, the turbulence off of Dismore's car causes uh, Tony to probably be saying things under his breath. Looking down for the blimp. Good chance to look at the interval. They cross the line this next time. It'll be 14 laps to go. They're taking those miles off quickly now. Traffic oh. ahead. Stewart makes a move. Well, but he gets bottled. Tony oh. saw this, the uh, the traffic came coming up, and he tried to make a dive down, but uh, Mark protected that position pretty well. But we're in the Dismore pit now. We've moved to this end here, and the crew is showing signs of indecision. We're asking about it. We asked Dashboard Dan, the man who runs the computer, and he said, I frankly don't know. They're watching the numbers very, very closely. They're in communication on every lap. Chris Caron on the wall. No final decision yet as to whether they're okay. Obviously, they are gambling and are going to try to make it. Well, as the leader, you have no choice, I would think. You've got to stay in front if you think that it's marginal at all. On the other hand, if you thought it was three laps, then you need to dive for the pit. Well, it's a new team. Uh, they're out to win races. I don't see them stopping until that thing runs out of fuel. Stewart working through traffic. 12 to go. He still can't catch him. Well, he can catch him, but again, when he gets close, uh, he loses the air in that front end of that car, and uh, when he loses just a little bit of air, it compounds that push of car. Well, slower traffic ahead once again. That's the key. Can Mark anticipate this traffic as he approaches it and not get held up? If he rolls out of that throttle just a little bit, Tony's going to be there. A short track race driver, he's going to fill the gap. In the Next time by, it'll be 10 laps to go as they flash across that line. Of course, the whole idea of the Pep Boys Indy Racing League was to provide opportunity for drivers. And that's exactly what's happening here. Here's Mark Dismore. He's never scored a, vis a victory at all. He is out in front of Tony Stewart, who has been one of the most powerful guys in the sport. And because of the equity in the rules and some great race driving, he's holding them off. But traffic ahead. Well, there are. There are two cars right in front of him uh, that are running about the same speed. But they are going to catch it before this race is over. And those two guys are racing with each other. So this is going to get good here in a couple of laps. You tuned in for the senior skins. We're seeing some great racing. You may just like motorsports if you weren't already a fan when this one's over. Jack? Well, John Menard, your driver's running second. Time is running out. Can he pass Mark Dismore? Well, I sure hope so, or we're not going to win this race. But, well, did uh, you tell him anything? Well, we're, he's racing as hard as he can race, and uh, we hope Mark doesn't have enough fuel, but we don't know. So we're going to just have to pass them. Well, well, I think that tells us the story. They know that there may be a fuel question, guys. Well, they got a little bit of help. Dismore got a little bit of help there. That One of the two cars right in front of him pulled over, saw the traffic coming, and then uh, gave him a break, let him go by on the inside. So Mark Dismore, the number 28 car, red and black. He's the leader. That yellow car, number one, is Tony Stewart in second place. That is the battle on the court. Third is the 77 car, Stefan Gregoire. Traffic is the key. See right there, Dismore got a little better shot. He was able to close the traffic better, yeah. and that set Stewart back. Yeah, Mark did a good job there. There's Tice. He gave him room. Uh, he let him go. Yeah, but Tice Carlson saw both of them. Now Stewart's right back on him. Momentum is so critical on this kind of an oval. You lift that throttle even for a little bit, and it takes some time to come back up to speed. If the other guy didn't breathe it at all, he's right there. Look at Stewart. He's on top of him now. Stewart's going to try to run down on the oh, inside. Oh, he got him. He got Stewart him on the inside. It. Tony Great Stewart job, goes to the Tony. lead. <laughs> You're hearing the two-way radio of the team. They love that. Five laps to go out of race command. It's the same old thing. Mark just had to check up just an ounce, and Tony was able to get that run. You can hear the crew. They're pretty excited. That's Dismore, Dismore's crew trying to give him a little confidence, saying, hang in there, pal. Here's the fight for third place. Stefan Gregoire, the blue car on the left. Jeff Ward on the right of your screen. 
Dismore is out of gas. Yep. Dismore is in the pits. The crew well, is scrambling, Paul. Dismore is out of fuel. They knew it was marginal. Here he is now just gliding in, and he bumps up over a hose. The fielder almost hit the wall. This is going to cost them several positions in the finishing order. Great disappointment. They rolled the dice. Unfortunately, they lost. But they took the only gamble that they could. They were leading the race on their way to giving Mark Dismore his first win. So that means that Tony Stewart for the moment is unchallenged. Stefan Gregoire comes to second place. What a great run for the Chastain team. Jeff Ward up to third, Davey Hamilton up to fourth. White flag, white flag. The white flag, one more lap, one more mile for Tony Stewart. He took on the extra fuel, so he's got plenty of fuel to get there. But let me tell you, behind Tony Stewart, some of these other teams are really going to be jumping. Battle for second, and Jeff Ward goes past. Chastain car has a problem as Gregoire slows down. Stewart takes the win. Now we watch for the battle for second place. Chastain's out of fuel. Look at the cars running slow on the inside. Everybody's close. I think... I think about half the field ran out of fuel on the last lap. They were cutting at that close. And Tony Stewart takes the win to start off the 1998 Pep Boys IRL season. Does that put him in a position for the Indianapolis 500? And of course, here on ABC, we're going to have all the coverage that leads you right up to the running of the Indianapolis 500. Coming up next, it's the Senior Sins game. Screw this, you watch this down here.